I'm happy to be here with all of you tonight in Denver. I love Focus. I'm grateful for Focus. A special hello to everybody who is joining us by, by live stream with a, with a little bit of affection for the 700 or so from the Dakotas, from the Focus campuses in the Dakotas, who are gathered at the University of Mary tonight. I wish I were there with you. Um, I'll be home soon, so don't burn the place down. <laughs> Let's pray. Oh Jesus, give us your heart with which to love. Amen. Why did Jesus die? What was Christ doing on the cross? For the last two years, the whole world has been in the grip of a pandemic. In the grip of a virus, it is contagious and sometimes fatal. It has been massively disruptive and it's caused a whole lot of fear. But from the vantage of Christian faith, the reason that we would be afraid of a virus, the reason we would be afraid of any sickness or any sharp or painful thing is because we are already very sick. We are immunocompromised. All of us have a deadly sickness which is 100% fatal and which is so contagious that we were already born with it. And that sickness is death. Viruses don't really cause death when you think about it. Nothing on this earth outside of us that comes against us can really cause death. We're afraid of those things because we're doomed to die and because they can hasten death or bring it to us faster. But the real ultimate cause of death is sin. Sin separates us from God, who is the source of all life. The human race at the very beginning, through pride and rebellion, willfully cut ourselves off from God. That terrible, ancient catastrophe is called the fall. And we did it because we wanted knowledge and power. But our desires didn't come to pass. We didn't get the things that we wanted. Instead, we fell victim to cruel, malevolent creatures who have enslaved us. And so we're left weak and wounded and terrified, not just of viruses, we're terrified of everything. Now, we're very smart and crafty. And so in modern times, we've been able to make a lot of progress in finding answers to our fears and keeping them at bay, at least for a time. Disease, hunger, poverty, the extremes of cold and heat. But these victories are like the healing of little flea bites in comparison with the real enemy that faces us. And over that enemy, we have not been able to achieve even a scrap of power or relief. And that enemy is death. Death is the shame of our race. It is the deepest of all our fears. It covers over and brings to an end even the brightest and the healthiest of lives and reduces them to insignificance. It rips apart 
friends and lovers and families. The Book of Wisdom says, by the envy of the devil, death entered the world. And those who are of his party experience it. God came to us in Christ to deal with our enemies. He intends to free us from every oppressive evil, physical, mental, emotional, relational. But the enemy that comprises all other enemies is death. If God did not deal with that, everything else would just be so much dancing on the edge of the grave. But Christ went for the jugular. He determined to deal with the real enemy of the human race. Not disease or poverty, natural disasters or wild animals, not anything that we fear, but that which is the source and center of all those lesser ills. The reign of the Prince of Darkness and the fruit of his reign, death. How did Christ conquer this powerful enemy? He did it by going to the cross, taking on human flesh, assuming our nature, along with the burden of weakness of fallen human nature, he allowed himself to be led away by his enemies, tortured cruelly, scorned and mocked, and then executed in an excruciatingly brutal way. By death, strangely, mysteriously, Christ conquered death. And so, death is not just something that the Lord is going to allow to captivate us. He's going to set us free. And death is not the punishment of a wrathful God toward those who he has been angry with. No, death is the natural, direct, and tragic consequence of disobedience, of cutting ourselves off from the source of all life, because life is nothing more, life is nothing more than friendship with God. And Jesus didn't crudely exchange himself his life for our life in dying for us. Instead, he got inside. He took upon himself our nature. He was in solidarity with the guilty so that he could transform our situation from within. And he did it as a mighty warrior. St. Ephraim says that death killed Jesus by means of his human body but then his human body became the means by which Jesus would conquer death. He said Jesus was, in, was looking for a chariot by which he could ride into the underworld. And he found that chariot in the body given to him by the Virgin Mary. It's amazing. You see, what we think is happening when we're looking at a crucifix, there's much more happening. There's much more happening. Behind the veil, behind the veil there's a great battle which is happening when we look at a crucifix. God and his ancient enemy are engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat on the crucifix. And the devil is falling from his mighty throne like lightning from the sky. In his passion and death, everything that Jesus touches is made new. Do you remember early in his ministry when he touched a leper? He should have been made unclean. But by a kind of heavenly magic, 
everything got turned around. Rather than being corrupted by the touch of the leper, the leper became clean by his touch. Here the same thing is happening, but on a massive scale. Every blow and beating that comes against Jesus is turned against his foe. Every single temptation or dark thought that touches his mind is transformed into a song of praise and dissolved. Every weapon that comes against him is turned against his assailant. Death towers over him to devour him, and itself is destroyed and devoured. All the ancient cruel hatred of the enemy for the human race is concentrated in the crucifix on this one frail form. And as that hatred touches him, touches the current of divine love, it melts away like a snowball thrown into the mouth of a volcano. The cross of Christ is the moment when the human race in Jesus threw off our slavery became free of our ancient bondage and learned to live again. And so when we look at a crucifix, though we grieve our sins, which brought our Lord to that cruel death, we're also cheering him on. Proud of our king, so valiant in battle, so potent against all evil, so victorious, so victorious. This is the battle that the Lord is fighting for us. And we should see him as a warrior upon the cross. You know who has a good, fresh take on this is Father John Ricardo in his little book, Rescued. If you want the story of salvation really to sink into you, get rescued by Father John Ricardo Get the real story by Edward Sri and Curtis Martin, and listen to the Christian mythic narrative over on Prime Matters. This all is the atonement, being at one, at one meant. Jesus reconciles us to the Father by means of the battle that he fights, taking upon himself our nature, and by means of that nature, and the strength of his divinity, which is hidden from the devil, destroying the devil and his reign. It's amazingly beautiful what he's done for us. He's not just a warrior, though. He's also a lover. Jesus isn't just fighting. He's showing us the love of the Father. Elie Wiesel was a 15-year-old boy in the horrors of the Buchenwald concentration camp. And he writes in his memoir, Night, about what it was like to be there. And one day they hung three prisoners, two adults and one young child with bright eyes. And then they had to march past the prisoners. And the two men were dead. Their mouths were open and their tongues were blue. But the little child, because he was so light, was still writhing on the rope. The light in his eyes wasn't extinguished yet. His tongue was red still. And they had to watch him there for half an hour. And a voice behind Elie Wiesel said, for God's sake, where is God? And he said, within myself, I heard the answer. God's here on this gallows, that's where. And Elie Wiesel was right. God's love is so great that he wants to be with us. He wants to be with us so much and identify with our suffering so that no one who really suffers will ever think that they are alone. Those who are abandoned and lonely will know that they have a Lord who was denied and betrayed by his closest friends. Those whose bodies are broken and failing have a Savior whose back was torn whose head was pierced, whose hands and feet were nailed. Those despairing or depressed 
have a redeemer who cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those who were victims of abuse have a Christ who was humiliated, beaten, ridiculed, violated, stripped to shame, and left to die in the sight of everybody. Those who have no food or home or clothing have a king whose only earthly possession was one tunic ripped from his bloody body, gambled away, who had to be buried in a borrowed tomb. Those who battle drugs and alcohol have a God who cried out with a parched mouth and cracking lips, I thirst. Those who are bitterly oppressed and ashamed and made to feel hopeless by long habits of lust have a Messiah whose flesh burned in the scourging who couldn't help from himself from falling down, not till he was naked and nailed. And all the people whose families are falling apart, who toss and turn at night, worrying about those they love, have Jesus who looked down from the cross only to see his own dear mother convulsed in grief. When Jesus was born at Bethlehem, when the wood around his body was a manger and not a cross, he was called Emmanuel, God with us. He sure is. Once when I was teaching a class, I was talking with my students about this. Sometimes in education, everything goes right. And we suddenly realized all together, our minds came together around the love of Jesus and how eloquent the cross is as an invitation to life with him. One girl said, it's almost, it's almost if you look long enough, it's like he's flirting with us. He's trying to win our love. And look at a crucifix and you'll see that. You'll see it in his eyes. He's beckoning you, not with his hands, can't move those, not with his feet. Those are pinned down. He can't come running after you. He can't grab you. There's no coercion, no force, just his eyes. But those eyes, those eyes so full of love, and you look into them and you think to yourself, oh my goodness, my life is a car wreck. Nobody's fine. If you scratch the surface just a little bit, nobody's doing okay. And yet here's somebody who's in worse shape than all of us, and he's chosen to be there, and he's chosen it for love of us. And you look into his eyes, and the gaze of Jesus goes right into you. And you find yourself wanting to be a part of his life. You find yourself at one with him. And his eyes call out to you. How will you answer? I don't know. That's the next talk. Adoramos te Christe et benedicimus tibi, quia per sanctum crucem tuum, redemisti mundum. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Thank you.